Welcome to our video, Japan and the World. The topic for this time is, CCP's Senkaku Island Strategy. I would like to focus again on Real Issues, Real Voices, Real Japan podcast presented by Japan Forward, originally, on July 7, 2022. Jennifer Zung chats with the Japan Forward editorial team in a discussion on the CCP's aggressive actions in attempting to unify with Taiwan using the Senkaku Islands territorial issue. Among others, Jennifer Zung was a researcher at the Development Research Center of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, the highest level governmental policy research and consultant body. In today's session, we're joined by Jennifer Zhang for the first time. She was a researcher at the Development Research Center of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, the highest level of governmental policy research and consultant body. Nowadays, Jennifer operates a channel called Inconvenient Truths, which aims to offer the fastest, authentic, uncensored first-hand information from inside China, as well as unique in-depth analysis and insights about China's current affairs and politics. Today, we talk about the CCP's aggressive actions in attempting to unify with Taiwan using the Senkaku Islands territorial issues, among others. Let's listen in. Thank you to our listeners and followers for joining us again for our weekly Twitter space. Every week we're seeing more people join us for this live conversation and we appreciate it very much. Before we get started, let us introduce ourselves. For anybody unfamiliar with Japan Forward, we started in 2017 with the goal to reach global audiences by sharing stories, opinions and editorial content from Japan. Our mission, shared by our supporters and followers, is to raise awareness of the Japanese spirit, culture, and tradition. Okay, so let's introduce some of our um, editorial staff who are also in this Twitter space. Um, I know Naiti like San, you, you talked about yourself a little bit, but can you give an introduction about yourself? <laughs> oh, okay, well, once again. <laughs> but thank you, Galileo, and uh, thank you, uh, listeners, for being with us. Uh, I'm Yasuo Naito, Editor-in-Chief of Japan Forward. And uh, was, as I've already told you, um, uh, I used to be, well, I am uh, 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 the correspondent for the Sankei Shimpun and I've been to Russia and the other, you know, uh, the countries, Britain, uh, United States, but not in China. And, uh, you know, the China is the very well, center spot for the international politics now, so we're kind of uh, uh, really interested in. And welcome, Jennifer, and uh, it's a great honor to hear from you uh, about Chinese recent behavior around Japan and Senkaku. Thank you. All right, thank you, Naito-san. And also we have Ariel who's in the call. Hi, um, it's uh, great to participate today. My name is Ariel Bustito. I am a reporter at Japan Forward, um, and uh, I've been uh, here since uh, 2018. Uh, I have been following with great interest uh, the sort of Japanese-Chinese relations. So I think it, today is a very significant day um, to be discussing uh, the issues. So I'm very excited to be participating today. Thanks, Ariel. And our guest today is Jennifer Zeng, who was a researcher at the Development Research Center at the State Council of the People's Republic of China the highest level governmental policy research and consultant body. Jennifer also operates a YouTube channel called Inconvenient Truths, which aims at offering authentic, fastest uncensored first-hand information from inside China, as well as unique in-depth analysis and insights about China's current affairs and politics. Welcome to our podcast. It's nice to speak with you today, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So, yeah, before we get into some of the questions we've prepared, um, would you kindly give an introduction to our listeners who you are, who may be listening to you for the first time? Okay. Uh, as uh, the host already introduced, I come from China. I once worked for the Development Research and Research uh, Center of the State Council. Yes, yeah, that's the highest level government policy study and research uh, 
body. And uh, so I was a researcher there. I once wrote uh, speeches for the prime minister of China. I once wrote a speech for him to read out at the United Nations. Then I worked for a financial consultant company for another several years. And then because of my uh, practice of Falun Gong, uh, meditation, a yoga type, type of uh, self-improvement system, I ended up in labor camp. I was there for one year and then I escaped to Australia to seek asylum and which I did it. So I stayed in Australia for 10 years and then I moved in New York okay. uh, in 20, to, uh, 2011. So I've been doing media work for the past 20 some years. I started hosting my own YouTube channel in Convenient Truth by Jennifer Zen since two years ago. So that's basically my brief introduction. Yes, and your channel's quite successful um, with over 50,000 followers, subscribers. Um, and, and you mentioned in your YouTube channel that uh, like the YouTube algorithm or the AI bots um, suppress your, your channel and given you a community strike. And we hope that doesn't continue. But, and we, I enjoy the content that you have. Very insightful and very, yeah, it's very insightful. You won't see a lot of the content published anywhere else. And that's why, yeah, we, we were speaking to you today. In the context of today's session, um, several weeks ago, you published an article with us called um, Unifying Taiwan Begins with the Senkakus. So the first question I have or is, you mentioned the word unifying. Uh, could you elaborate on what you meant by unifying? Is this a beneficial relationship for Japan and Taiwan? Uh, yes, I'm glad you asked that question. Actually, when the article was first published, I got some feedback from a very close friend saying, uh, maybe I should not have used the word unifying because that word was actually the propaganda or the narrative of the Chinese Communist Party. And the reason I use that is I kind of want to give my audience and the readers a feeling of how the Chinese people, you know, because these words, uh, this uh, narrative, uh, they, all the Chinese people can get from inside China. So that is the wording of the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda for all these years. They always called, they need to unify Taiwan because we are one family, we are one country, and so we need to be unified. So by using that that word, it is um, it work on people's I think subconscious to regard this same thing so this some um, this is something as sacred as a glorious a mission to achieve for to our great China. So somehow I I quote the CCP's word. I, I think maybe I should have gave a quotation mark outside the word unifying to let the readers know that is a direct quote or tra direct translation of the word um, the, the CCP use. In Chinese, they say Tong Yi Taiwan. Tong Yi is unified. So we need to become, we are one family, so we need, need to become one family. So I think this is a very important psychological and mental game the CCP has played against its, its own people for all these years. Not only this one word, they have actually created a whole set of their own words uh, based on traditional Chinese words, but they've total uh, give those uh, Chinese words a totally different connotation to what it originally means and created a whole system of party culture which is very poisonous, mm. full of hatred and full of... Uh, anti-humanity kind of right. uh, in that connotation. So that's that's a very that's actually what what it means by unifying with in, in outside of China we would say China uh, the CCP want to take Taiwan or attack Taiwan or invade Taiwan or conquer Taiwan. That's mm -hmm. what they mean by unifying. 
Do you think that they're intentionally using these words to appeal to a Western audience? Um, yes, I think they also want to somehow polish uh, their behavior by using some, you know, uh, friendly and or not that threatening word uh, yeah. to to sound like they are friendly, they are not harmful, uh, they are love lovable. Like Xi Jinping mentioned, they they uh, he ordered the propaganda govern uh, pro- propaganda department of China to tell the Chinese story well to the world to portray a love lovable, admir- uh, admirable uh, or respectful image of China. So of course they want to appeal to the Western audience as well. I'll definitely keep that in mind when I read more um, narratives like that of unifying or coming together. I think it's, it's a good warning and it's a good um, mind frame to keep that there's a different agenda going on. Yes. Um, so in your opinion, what challenges does, um, so in your, again referring to your article, you mentioned um, the words anti-Japan propaganda and hate Japan or Japan hate. So in your opinion, what challenges does anti-Japan propaganda and hate Japan indoctrination um, present to China-Japan relations or China-Japan-Taiwan relations? I've, I, of course, like I said, it's poisonous propaganda. I think just yesterday I tweet, uh, a tweet a video, I retweeted actually a video of a so-called Little Pink brainwash the Chinese student in Australia yes. physically punched uh, I think a Hong Kong guy saying something freedom for Hong Kong he was there protesting against the CCP's crackdown on Hong Kong so he physically attacked a peaceful you know people who are just peacefully express his view uh, on Hong Kong. So you can see that also the hate Hong Kong propaganda does. That's what the hate Hong Kong propaganda does on that little pink brainwash Chinese guy. So if that kind of hate Japan propaganda, I, I think I I linked a few video in that article of mine showing that actually they started this education as young as in kindergarten. Kindergarten were given homework to do uh, at the home and ask, ask their uh, parents to shoot the video to upload to their school to prove that they have done the homework. So in that homework, the mom plays a Japanese soldier. The, the little kid, I think he's only at most five years old or, mm. or, or even maybe only four years old. He killed his mom, who is supposed to to be a Japanese, with a long knife, and then his his mom died, and they declare victory. So that's the vict- That's the homework the Chinese kids are doing in their home. So that kind of education or indoctrination started as young as kindergarten, and you can imagine. Uh, because they are educated like this uh, all those years, so they are uh, uh, from their kindergarten all through to their adult ages. So any so any time if the CCP really want to launch a real attack on Taiwan on Japanese, that kind of people is very easy to be manipulated because in their mind, anti-Japan kill a Japanese soldier is as rightful a thing to do under the sun as maybe to defend their motherland or defend anything that is rightful. So, so that's the it's already in their subconscious. They don't realize anything wrong. Maybe killing a human mm. being is wrong, but killing a Japanese is is great, is righteous. So that's how dangerous it is, as far as I can see it. Yeah, that's that's very troublesome to know that all this. Um, was it uh, hate? Unnecessary hate is like one-sided, um, and it's, I, I would yeah. assess it that it's unwarranted. That 
this hate is going on um, from a very young age and they're trained or to develop that kind of mind. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you mentioned in your article that there are already military recruitment activities in China. Um, there's posters um, actively recruiting young um, men, young people in China to be part of uh, military. Uh, what's your assessment of this? Yes, like I showed in the article, I found some videos, I think the propaganda videos they did, uh, showing that from March this year, all kinds of recruitment propaganda posters were put in all the subway stations of Guangzhou city and, and in some universities as well. So that is perhaps... Um, they, you can say, routine uh, recruit, recruitment activity. I think they do that every year. But this year, maybe on a larger scale, they do better propaganda. But the other day, I saw something on Twitter, I think, that is more worrying. Uh, someone, I don't know, he, he posted in Chinese, he saying that he called his aunt, his aunt said his cousin inside China who had retired from i think he was uh, he used to work for the air force of people's liberation army pla but he retired six years ago but this year he suddenly uh were was called back to the army and he is now serving in the navy uh department in zhejiang province he, he said he was giving some training so his aunt can't uh you know contact with him and this guy said also one of his colleagues said um, someone he knew was also called back to serve in the army who have already retired. So this is, of course, just two cases. But as we know, uh, the CCP always cover up everything that is really going on. So if we already know two individual cases, this could be happening on a very large scale, which we don't know yet. But that's definitely worth notice. Just on that note, you mentioned about cover-ups. I saw recently a video that was uh, making rounds on Twitter and social media uh, of something that happened in Sydney recently. Um, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the University of Technology Sydney? Yes, kind of. I, I lived in Sydney for several years. So okay, so that. recently there was a video. Um, I think it was the ambassador um, of... Uh, to China in, in Australia, and he's giving a speech at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, yeah. And a Uyghur man uh, was, yeah, like stood up in the audience and um, made a claim that, you know, there's damage being done or we're being oppressed. And immediately um, the university staff removed that person and like shut them up. Um, mm -hmm. And there are cases of like that, of like, of similar cases of, of like that of people being stopped um because mm -hmm. it was against um like the ccp and stuff mm -hmm. like that so lots of cover-ups going on yes um, i think that's not only cover-up if a university in sydney could do that on behalf of the ccp it it indicates that university has already you know either pull over or give instructions for whatever reason. I know many universities in Sydney as well as other uh, countries, they, they got, you know, uh, like how to say that, financial support, let's right. say it in that way, from the CCP. So they pretty much, you know, like we Chinese said, you, you give, you receive somebody's money, you have to work for that person. So they can work or serve the CCP's purpose in Western countries. I think that is very, very sad. Um, so back to, I guess, our main topic of um, China, trying to recruit righteous Taiwan um, to unify the same countries. Maybe a question I'd like to develop on that is, do you think Japan should be seeking support from other countries if this um, was to, to happen? 
Definitely. I think uh, because the CCP's ambition, I think, actually does not limit it to Taiwan or to Japan. You can see in that all mobilization plan, they were talking about forward forward deployment. They are talking about they want to deploy it, deploy their crews or their warships outside the first island chain or as as further away as it could. So actually they have the US mainland in their mind if they want to do that. So if that is the goal, I think the whole world should be very, very worried. Actually, uh, you know, Lu De, who initially released the Chinese uh, version of that top secret audio of the CCP's own mobilization file, he told because the idea of starting some, you know, conflict uh, in in this uh Sakaku Island to create, you know, an anti-Japan, uh, like they said, united front with with the Kuomintang in Taiwan, so they can work from outside of Taiwan, or inside of Taiwan, maybe to take over Taiwan without actual uh, battle. So that's the plan. And I asked him, how could they create? any frictions or any conflicts in Sakuka if this plan is already leaked and Japan already knows and Japan would not respond or be hooked onto their plan. And the Luda told me, you know what, the CCP is very good at creating anything and they can actually, according to him, they are already preparing something when they do the so-called exercises, they are actually shooting videos, creating something. If the time is ripe, they release those things on TikTok, on social media. So uh, when people saw those videos, they will be very, very angry. They were saying uh, things are really happening like what they see in the videos. So this remind me of, you know, a Tiananmen massacre or a Tiananmen immolation video that the CCP created back in 2001 because they cracked down on this peaceful movement of Falun Gong and uh, because people were asking why would we crack down on, the, on this group so hard. So mm -hmm. people did not want to work with the CCP or to cooperate with the CCP's crack. Mm -hmm. down. So they then, I think it's they then uh, CCP police head Luo Gan, he created a force emanation of Falun Gong practitioners on Tiananmen Square and then declared this is an evil card. It will encourage its member to burn themselves. Then all everybody in China started to hate Falun Gong so badly. So my mm. point here is They've already done this in 2001. Yeah. So if this was the plan, they, they, are, they, are, they are planning or they've already done something according to Luda. I think we need, really need to think of ways how we can deal with this if this kind of video really started to appear yeah. on TikTok on a large scale, how we should respond. So really we need to think it over well now yes 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 i totally agree with you yes so so for this kind of large scale activity and because the ccp is already the number one uh, you know country in terms of the GDP value and also I think in terms of the military build up. Japan has not been really build up any military force or according to its own constitution. There are a lot of things Japan cannot do. Of course, the US is uh, open, op, obliged to, to defend Taiwan or uh, Japan if Japan is, is under attack. But I think maybe uh, Japan, uh, now everything is changing so fast the tension is increasing uh, daily i think in the, the recent of uh, the past year so japan i think definitely should uh, seek more uh, actively seek more uh, 
I, uh, I think oh, support or help uh, with its uh, allies, with you know other countries who share the same value because defending the CCP's aggressive military threat is not, you know, the task of Japan only. I think many countries in the nearby China as well as US, I think is all under its military threat. Yes, and I think some of the content that we published on, on Japan for share that same sentiment of Japan working closely with allies in the Indian Pacific, also like the Quad, um, also opening up um, more partnerships within European um, nations. Um, so we definitely, I think, yeah, we need, we need to keep checking out for those headlines and news to see the progression of Japan um, building um, allies to, yes, maybe to counter um, a sudden move by China. Uh, yes. We have a question from Ariel. Ariel, you, yeah. you there? Yes, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to bring uh, a question on less on the Senkaku and more on, um, well, I guess you mentioned before Hong Kong, because uh, obviously, as I'm sure you know, today uh, Hong Kong is marking 25 years since Britain returned the city to China. Um, and so I kind of wanted to ask um, your opinion on, you know, have you been following uh, how this day has panned out? Um, and did you have any thoughts on, uh, on today's like anniversary, I guess? And on the basis of what you've seen, do you have a message of, to, for example, to say the people of Hong Kong or the people in Taiwan and so on, what are the next 25 years going to look like? What message would you like to send to them? Yes, of course, I think everybody noticed uh, the crazy security measures uh, has been adopting in Hong Kong because she uh, obviously trusted nobody and he shortened his schedule in Hong Kong. That only says how he dare not or distrust the people of Hong Kong because I think he instinctly regard anybody who has a pursuit for freedom as his fatal enemy. That's why he put on so tight security in Hong Kong with his short visit. And his a visit this time to Hong Kong, of course, is the 25th anniversary of the so-called uh, taking back Hong Kong uh, from the CCP 25 years ago. And this time, I think 25 years ago, when we look back at that day today, we definitely knew that the start of the beginning of the death of a free China. And, and but then 25 years ago, because of the so-called national security law the CCP is imposing on Hong Kong now, Hong Kong is totally, completely Hong Kong's freedom. And um, perhaps prosperity is already killed by the CCP. So he was there to declare a second death of or the, 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 the death of Hong Kong's freedom for the second time. So the, the process, the Hong Kong one of uh, the CCP was promised Hong Kong at least 50 years of continuous freedom or their existing way of living for at least 50 years. But we are only halfway there and Hong Kong's the freedom, prosperity, and everything and its lifestyle, I think, has already been totally ruined by the CCP. And in the anti-exhibition bill protest in 2019, many young people were actually killed, imprisoned. I knew several women. I had their video on my YouTube channel. They personally came out to testify that were, they were raped by the CCP police when, we, when they were arrested. So I think that is very heart-wrenching to see such a beautiful and prosperous, a freedom-loving place of Hong Kong got totally ruined and killed in front of everybody, in front of the 
eyes of the world little by little by the city city and then suddenly of course i said i think the pros process ex uh, accelerated in 2019 that was nearly three years ago so uh we saw how i think what a tragedy that is such a beautiful place such a free place you know killed by this uh CCP regime in such a short time. So I think the world should really learn a hard lesson from the people of Hong Kong, from their fate, from what they experienced and what they satisfied. Just like a Hong Kong girl once flew to Taiwan, hold a banner saying, please treasure your vote. We can show you once. Of course, everybody can die once to show you if we, if you follow our route, this is your fate, but we can only die once to show you this will be your fate. If you, you know, accept the CCP's so-called one country, two system, actually this one country, two system agenda was initially created for Taiwan. They, they want to test it on Hong Kong to try maybe to show Taiwan, see, Hong Kong is having, you know, their own system, so it's fine, we can uh, adopt this to Taiwan. But of course, they didn't realize the Hong Kong people would uh, uh, resist it so, uh, so uh, with their so hard. I think Hong Kong. I really uh, uh, admire the young people in Hong Kong for their for their fight, for their sacrifice. So I think the CCP didn't realize this. So it got them very angered. But they'd rather crush them to death than to, you know, the, the CCP never gives in any. Uh, pressure from the public because if once they did, there were so many wrong cases, so many people run, so many groups run. If they, you know, gave gave in to the pressure this time, everybody would stand stood up, and they think that were the end. That will be the end of the CCP. So they were never mm -hmm. dare to. So I think Hong Kong's story gave it should gave everybody in the world a hard lesson to to learn and to see through what the true, true color of the CCP is and never ever trust any one single word said by the CCP. Yeah, I think this last thought that you said is really compelling. So the fact that really um, Ch China showed its re true colors with the issues that happened in Hong Kong. So thank you for this very um, like eloquent response. I think my editor, Naita-san, has a question. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, uh, listening uh, the CCP's hate propaganda and, you know, the, the, the story in Hong Kong, uh, what reminds me of this is like, you know, the current ongoing Ukraine-Russia conflict. I mean, the Russia's invasion to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Russia uses, you know, uh, the Nazis, the word of Nazis to Ukraine and, you know, uh, they're justifying the invasion to the Ukraine. It's, it sounds like uh, similar to that. And uh, it is really dangerous. Uh, uh, things to to provocate hate propagandas, and uh, the recently we uh, published the the another article. Uh, it's it's on a South Korean uh, civic group uh, traveling to the Berlin uh, to try to remove the uh, comfort women stature, which is a symbol of the you know Japanese uh, 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 the 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 sex. Uh, the slave symbol or of, of the Japanese, you know, uh, the the uh, the imperial army, and you know, the the South Korean uh, the uh, the group is uh, saying that you know this is dangerous uh, to make another conflict uh, between West and you know the Japan. They're using the the lies. Uh, so, um, what do you think? Uh, you know, what we can do uh, or what we should do to counter this type of CCP's hate propaganda uh, or, and to stop the conflict. Uh, what is your kind of advice to, you know, the, us all? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, actually, I just went back from Washington D.C. The, the um, I think we we had a session in the International Religious Freedom Summit. Um, we had a session about uh, the China China's firewall. So I think that maybe the most important thing is we need to help the Chinese people to gain free access to free information outside of the CCP's firewall. I think truth is the most powerful uh, thing for uh, to overcome the CCP's lies and their violent you know, instigation against Chinese people. So I think if the Western world really want to help the Chinese people to enable them, to empower them, to see the truth, there are many things we can do from outside of China and that is the most effective and peaceful way to let the Chinese people see through the CCP as well, not to be deceived or incited by the CCP. So I think there are many things we can do and of course we can also proactively uh, spread the truth, spread the truth about you know, the true message from the civilized world and to tell them what the CCP has been telling you are all lies uh, and we don't want you know conflicts we want peace with you know peaceful Chinese people and we hope Chinese people can gain as much freedom as we outside of China so that kind of maybe method or or that I think, as far as I can see, that's the most effective way to counter the CCP. To I think, on the one hand, to separate the CCP from China, Chinese culture, and Chinese people. So I always told people, China and Chinese culture and Chinese history and Chinese people are held hostage by the CCP. So we need to save those CCP, those slaves. The first step to save them is to know, let them know the truth, to give them the power, uh, the access to know the truth. Then they were uh, I think I think they will naturally uh, stand up against the CCP or gain the courage if they know there are enough help outside of China and they know there are there are hope for them and they uh, they can fight against the CCP. Now I think many people are really very unhappy, especially after the lockdown in Shanghai uh, and in other parts of the country as well. Many people committed suicide because they, they found life is so hopeless. If they had the courage to kill themselves, why don't they have the courage to kill or to, to try to fight back against the CCP? Because now they didn't see any hope but if things is as as terrible as this like to the extent that they want to kill themselves they don't want to live on anymore so so somehow i think that uh, we we can pro proactively spread the peace message the truth of the ccp and the uh, peaceful agenda of the outside world we don't want to kill chinese people we don't want, want to you know beat china or that sort of thing uh, so that i think is the most powerful thing to do thank you very much that's uh, the real the 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 power of the truth is the most important message thank you thank you yes Jennifer, we have one question from our listener, and I'll just give them mm -hmm. access to, to speak right now. Um, mm -hmm. And then they'll ask, and um, I think it's, it's a good question. We're just waiting for them to connect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so please unmute your mic and ask your question. Thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Japan Forward, for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, I'm currently a Master of Economics uh, in Germany who likes to work on PhD related to geoeconomics. I'm a former research intern at uh, East Asia Center uh, at MPIDS in New Delhi. I worked under Dr. Jagannath Panda, who is also a regular contributor to Japan Forward. That is how I know about Japan Forward. So thanks for this opportunity. Uh, uh, Miss uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, like 
my question is basically taiwan continues to hold uh, official sovereign claims over many territories like uh, you have said uh, senkaku or like arunachal pradesh the northeast of india like uh, now it's almost impossible for taiwan to ever uh, officially fulfill those claims so isn't it in best interest of taiwan to gain more stronger commitments from japan and friendly countries like japan and india if it stops sovereign claims over areas like uh, senkaku and northeast of india then this may make uh, india or japan to commit more in terms of protecting taiwan from china what do you think about it thanks Mm, I don't. I'm not sure whether I completely uh, answer your question. Could uh, anybody else e- explain a little bit to me what uh, exactly was the question? Anybody understood better than me? So you basically you ask whether India or Japan were, should give more support to Taiwan. Is that yeah, the question? No, what I mean is if Taiwan stops, uh, if Taiwan officially rescinds its official claims over Senkaku or some of the territorial claims in India, like Taiwan continues to have official claims over certain territories, even in friendly countries. If Taiwan officially like retracts or rescinds those claims maybe countries like japan and india can support taiwan even more in better terms officially because like taiwan continues to have sovereign claims over certain regions right related to japan and india that's what my question was okay i see i think that's uh, you know the territory uh, claims as far as i can see is a very complicated one it has a long history and it has many much to do with national pride you know with the people's uh, nationalism so i I'm not sure whether I'm in a position to offer that kind of advice to Taiwan, uh, to the government of Taiwan. But I, what I can say is uh, the CCP is the biggest the threat to all humanity. So the number one priority of all people of the civilized world is need to... Uh, stand up against the CCP and to do something to prevent the CCP from destroying the entire world. I, I, I often say the ultimate goal of the CCP, perhaps it or one of its officials or its CCP leaders doesn't know this very uh, clearly, but when something was created, it has a mission. So when this, the CCP, I think itself in its communist manifesto, it says it call itself a specter. Okay, so a specter, it says the specter of communism is hovering, uh, uh, I think, on top of Europe or some, something like that. That's the opening statement of the communism manifesto. So this specter, this evil specter, when it was created, its mission was to destroy mankind knowingly or not or not know or unknowingly so sometimes it could not help it help itself when it do crazy things i still remember a reading a speech from shi hao tian he's a ccp general i think the vice minister of defense he claimed in somewhere i think someone sometime near 2002 he definitely mentioned because our he mentioned the U.S. the rivers in the U.S. are so clear, and uh, our land is polluted. If we want the people to support to uh, to continue to support us, we need to we need to lead the Chinese people to go out of China. We need to clear the American land. When he mean clear, he mean we need to kill all the people or remove them so we can take over this beautiful land, the rivers, the skies are still clean, unpolluted. So he definitely mentioned 
bioweapon, biological weapon is one of the best ways. So their unrestricted warfare, if they really initiate it, and we still have problem finding out the origin of this current COVID-19, right? And we don't know whether it's intentionally, unintentionally released from the lab in Wuhan. But back in 2002, they already mentioned the use of biological weapon to clear the land of America so that the CCP can take over, they can lead the CCP out, go out of China, so win the this, this people's support forever. So that kind of mindset, um, I think we need to remember. So when the CCP wants to create conflict, to create something, its goal is it's taking on the humanity. So I think all the other countries should put down their whatever their historic claims over whatever territory and to deal with the biggest threat of hum humanity together. So that's my point. Thanks for the answer and thanks for Japan Forward and uh, Galileo Ferrari for giving the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you for your question. Um, um, so, so Jennifer, thank you for your time and speaking with, with us today. We appreciate your insight and sharing your wisdom. The warnings and narratives you talked about that the CCP are trying to execute are a big concern for Japan, possibly affecting Japan-Taiwan relations and you know, other relations across the Indian Pacific. Your points about open and transparent education and about spreading the truth align with our vision at Japan Ford to eliminate misinformation and misconceptions about Japan and other countries. And it's just a, maybe you know, a goal um, to work closer to, to world peace. Uh, before we wrap up, do you have any announcements or anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, yes, I have. Like I said, I spoke at the uh, International uh, Religious Freedom Summit. I, I did a live in a stream of our session about to chill down the Chinese firewall, but the audio quality is very bad, but I've got a better quality one. So I'll try to upload it to my YouTube channel today. So anyone is interested in, to, in knowing the CCP's digital totalitarian at the ways to deal with uh, the Great Firewall, uh, welcome to uh, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and then maybe to watch that uh, that summit session about the tear down the China firewall. I'll try to up upload the video today. Okay, so yes, for our followers, please follow Jennifer on Twitter and look out for her articles on Japan Ford. Hopefully you can give us some more articles and we'd love to publish them. Um, subscribe to Jennifer's YouTube channel called Inconvenient Truths. Like her videos and send positive comments to her. Um, sure. Hopefully it'll be 100k followers by the end of this year. Um, listeners, thank you for joining us today. Follow us, Japan Forward, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We also have a YouTube channel, and this Twitter space will be distributed on Spotify and Apple Music. So make sure you subscribe to that as well. At Japan Forward, we are looking for contributors and writers. Get in contact with us if you want to submit a written piece. Also, let us know if you can translate English to Japanese or vice versa. Or if there's any other skill set that you have that you think would add value to our vision, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you for listening to the Real